Texas Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Giovanni. Welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, with me is my co-host Giovanni. Giovanni, how uh, how are you doing this evening? How are things in Texas? Everything, everything is lovely out here. We had great weather today, and uh, um, everything's just peachy out here. Nice sun and everything. I don't know where you at, but um, uh, yeah, but uh, but yeah, we're having a great time out here. I am in in rainy Portland, Oregon, and it has been cold and wet and and pretty gross. With us, our guest t- today is uh, Dr. Jeffrey K. Uh, as a retired psych- psychologist and who studies um, classified documents related to the Korean War, specifically about the biological and chemical use of, of, of weapons during that time. Dr. K, how are you doing this evening? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm doing fine. It's, I'm, I'm out in Hawaii, and of course, the weather here is great. Lucky duck. <laughs> we're, uh, we're here today to talk about the read, interview, and interrogation technique. That was uh, created by John E. Reed back in the 1940s and 50s. But before we do that, we're going to take a minute and let Dr. K take us through his uh, most recent article. Uh, Dr. K. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I just published an article uh, titled The Secret Plan Revealed, CIA Told to, quote, Destroy Those Supporting Communist Germ Warfare, quote, Myth. Because some of your listeners may know, you know, in the early 1950s, North Korea and China and the Soviet Union had begun accusing the United States of large-scale use of biological weapons. Um, They were dropping weapons, particularly weapons that were using insects, um, infected insects, uh, to spread uh, diseases like plague and cholera and glanders near military units and behind the lines and on civilian areas. Of course, the United States um, denied this vociferously and claimed that they would never do such a thing. But um, what happened was that in uh, May of 1952, uh, the world was kind of shocked when two or uh, two U.S. Uh, officers who were flyers testified publicly uh, on broadcast radio and I think uh, film and, and written confessions that they, in fact, had been involved in well, the, their units, their planes had been involved in the dropping of germ weapons on Korea and in China. And, the, um, and this uh, only accelerated over the next uh, couple of years um, in the sense of more revelations coming out. All told, there were 25 different written confessions by U.S. officers, um, airmen, and a couple of high-ranking Marines. Uh, two of the officers were very high ranking. They were colonels that worked in the Pentagon. And uh, one of them was the chief of staff of the third Marine Air Wing. And the other was, uh, um, had previously been working as secretary of defense uh, of the Air Force's office. Um, and, had, and both of them were, had been considered World War II flying aces, were heroes. And here they were testifying to this. So it was one of the biggest controversies of the 1950s. And uh, we still hear echoes today. Those of you who watched the Netflix documentary, Wormwood, might remember how um, a Fort Detrick researcher and uh, connected to the CIA by the name of Frank Olson um, had been murdered uh, by, uh, allegedly by the CIA. And uh, precisely because he had become a security risk because he was expressing uh, that he had doubts about this program and also the interrogation program that they were involved in, the United States government. And uh, we're also using drugs, you know, new, in those days, novel drugs like LSD and other drugs and other techniques um, to interrogate uh, people for national security or military reasons. But this, this will touch into the Reed issue because... Uh, John Reed, who you mentioned, of course, uh, became famous for developing a paradigm of interrogation, um, which I guess we'll talk about. That, uh, but, but Reed himself, apparently, um, it's not known if he was involved in, in the research, but the researchers knew of him and were funding some of his work, the Department of Defense, in the early 50s, around the same time. It doesn't mean Reed knew anything about term warfare in Korea. I'm not saying that that's not true. You just asked me. So my latest article looks at a 
a plan that came that finally came to fruition in October of 1953 after uh, um, after um, another 19 or so uh, confessions were published by the Chinese about U.S. germ warfare, and it kind of uh, the U.S. national security establishment went you know uh, ape shit. They were freaking out, you know, and uh, they were angry, you know, and they were. Uh, doing their best to, to come up with some way to, to deal with all this. And they had to admit to themselves that the propaganda they'd put out in the previous year hadn't worked very well. So they now were proposing more propaganda, but also covert actions now, which the CIA would be in charge, that would use what they got to quote, personalized seduction and coercion urgently, urgently against persons or groups who were propagating what they were calling the communist biological warfare myth, um, part of what they were also calling internally a hate America campaign being run on all of this from their mind was all being run from Moscow. Uh, you know, the fact that the North Koreans and the Chinese independently were investigating this and writing about it, talking about it, um, you know, uh, uh, seemed to go past that fly over their heads in the 19, in, in the height of the early cold war, the Korean war to the Cold Warriors in the United States government, everything came out of Moscow. You know, North Korea invaded South Korea because Moscow told them to, right? Mao did whatever Moscow told them to do. Today, we know that that's not true. No. But um, in those it's days, the king, what? It's including Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, Moscow, he was an agent of Moscow. That's right. Martin right. Luther King, another agent of Moscow, right, yes. Interestingly enough, John Reed, uh, it turns out there is a link between John Reed and the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King. Really? Right. Tangentially. That Playboy magazine um, hired John Reed. I know we're skipping around here, but I, just, I, I might forget otherwise. Playboy magazine at one point hired John Reed to uh, give a lie detector test to, um, you know, what's his name? The, the alleged assassin of uh, Martin Luther King. Um, uh, James Earl Ray. James Earl Ray, yes. And of course, it came out and said, yes, of course, Reed said that he was validated that Reed, uh, that, that Ray was lying about not killing King and that he was, you know, therefore, he must have, he failed the lie detector test and he therefore had to be the assassin. So it's just kind of an interesting thing where these people pop up in certain places. Um, there has to be more substantial history about John Reed and his involvement with all of this separate from the Reed technique. As I said, you asked me about John Reed before, and I'd, I'd come across him because of my earlier work about Guantanamo and interrogations and torture. Your listeners may or may not know that I, I worked as a torture rehab facility in the United States called Survivors International in the San Francisco Bay Area. I interviewed many torture victims, not American torture victims, by the way, but torture victims. I, sad to say, torture is not just some sort of American evil or problem, but it, Almost every country in the world apparently practices or has practiced torture. And the United States, with all of the problems it has with its own asylum system, is still, in many ways, uh, so far better than most other countries. And so many people will come to the United States seeking asylum. And um, of course, the United, right now, they're trying to, and under Trump, it started, and they're trying to keep people from coming here. I worked for, you know, and did evaluations of, of torture victims, and I did some psychotherapy with torture victims as well. So I got to know and identify somewhat with what it's like to be tortured and also to what it's like to interrogate someone. Because when you do an in-depth evaluation, psychological evaluation of a torture victim, it's kind of like an interrogation. Um, I try to make it as little like it as possible, but how do I say it's like it? Because... Like the uh, interrogation that John Reed advocates, uh, his style is the, the interrogation is done in private. And yes, my evaluation is done in private. And, um, but the difference is the John Reed version of interrogation, they predetermine whether you're guilty or not. They do an evaluation and if the interrogation or the cops, in other words, the prosecutor decides that you're guilty or reasonably sure that you're guilty, then they're going to do a style of interrogation which unfortunately often seems to produce false confessions. I was and, reading on this, what is that? The, uh, the New Yorker article called yeah. an interview it talks about that. And it's saying there's a high percentage of convictions being overturned because of, you know, false confessions. People have been exonerated because of false confessions, like years. I mean, one of the examples that this article gives 
is a person that uh, that was sent to prison. He went through the read uh, technique. Uh, he yeah. was to murdering his wife. Uh, he went to prison. It took him about 50 years to get exonerated. Daryl Parker. Yes. Name. Uh, 1950s. Yes. Yes. And uh, even though there is a high, there's a high rate of, of cases of false confession, it's still a preferred method within the police department. And one of the things that I've noticed as, as reading this article is when they were talking about the technique that is used, like, you know, how, you know, the interview, then the interrogation, they start establishing this, this rapport with, with, with the person you're, you know, you're, you're interviewing, you know, you make them feel like, like you're on his side, you're trying to help them out. Wow. Um, you start, you know, you start planting, seeding, you know, different type of, you know, uh, ideas in this person. And at the end of the day, the person, you know, under pressure and everything just end up pretty much adopting, internalizing what well, well, pretty much you get what you've been beating. And when you look at these, uh, these police shows, right, they use the exact same technique, you know, in particular, if you ever. If you ever watch the Law and Order show, you know, it always ends and, and the, the, uh, person, the accused, uh, um, just opening up and just confessing, <laughs> you know, and they use the same technique. So I just, I just want to throw that in there. Yeah. I think, believe that article, you know, quotes the innocence project, which some of your listeners out there may be familiar with. It was a very chef, I think, from OJ Simpson trial fame many years ago. Anyway, he runs um, a project using DNA samples to exonerate people who are wrongly convicted. And uh, according to the Innocence Project figures, one third of those that are exonerated had confessed to the crime. In other words, they falsely confessed to the crime, proven by DNA evidence. They couldn't have done it. And yet they confessed. And, you know, it's people will say, why would somebody falsely confess to, to murder or some other terrible crime? Um, I said, it's a very good question, but as it turns out, you know, uh, everybody on some level has their breaking point. In the case of, of the guy you mentioned, Daryl Parker, you know, he broke after nine straight hours of interrogation, nine hours. Okay. Some people can take nine hours and they're not going to falsely confess. Maybe the majority of people, but it has to do with, um, you know, everybody carries around with them uh, feelings of guilt. Everyone can tolerate only so much stress, you know, de depending on who they are and the things that have happened to them in their life. I would imagine many of your listeners, if they think about it, have probably on a very small scale, in fact, admitted to things they haven't done, but, but, but just on a very small scale, right? Just because, well, it was easier to do at the time. But um, the read technique uses, I would say, non-scientific. They're not, not rigorously scientific. Over the years, the read has evolved and they've become sensitized to their critics. I and mean, then occasionally, you know, they've come up with some scientific basis to the critics against them, you know, such as what is the validity of studying ostensibly false confessions among a bunch of college students in a lab and some college campus have to do with an interrogation room where I'm bringing in, you know, somebody for mass murder. Mm -hmm. So they're saying it doesn't transfer over, but that doesn't change the fact that the read technique is based a lot on anecdotal police culture, pass down over generations, kinds of things. It certainly was a step up from the third degree where you take a, a lamp, you know, shine in somebody's face, don't let them eat, don't let them drink, shout in their face for hours on end. You know, I did until they confess to something. Maybe you beat them up a little bit or threaten to beat them up or threaten to hurt them. You know, the read technique, even at the beginning, specifically said you don't use coercion force like that. But they were doing other things that were kind of dubious and that psychologically were contributing to false confessions or appeared to be contributing to false confessions, such as keeping people isolated, you know, sympathize, you know, kind of, uh, Telling them that we know that you did it. We have all the information. We're just going to fill in some of the gaps. It wasn't always uh, being sympathetic. They also uh, used the good cop, bad cop routine. You know, sometimes, which is also known as button Jeff, which is the bad cop comes in and says, you know, you piece of crap. We know you did it. I should beat you to a, you know, no, uh, you're not supposed to say that in the read technique. That's supposed to say I should beat you up. But you would say, you know, you're just the lowest form of scum. And, you know, what will your parents think of you when they find out that you're a rapist, you know, and all this stuff. And, um, you know, just keep them at that. And then the good cop comes in and says, what are you doing? Get out of here. 
get the guy, you go in the other room and the good cop will sit down and say, you know, that guy, I'm so sorry. I, you know, really, I, I, he's probably a lot of stress in his life. He shouldn't be saying these things. I get it. I get it. That the woman who was asking for it, right? She was wearing this skimpy dress and everything and teasing you a lot. And, you know, I think anybody might've done what you did. Meanwhile, that if the person is innocent, this is, you know, by presenting them with a false dichotomy of one way to go or the other way to go, leaves them almost no out except to choose one of the two ways, either of which ends up in a false confession. And that's that kind of subtle psychological manipulation, whether meant to be manipulative or not. I don't believe that all the false confessions were false because um, they said that the cops or the interrogators set out to produce a false confession. Sometimes I think that did happen, but I think probably more often you would get what's called confirmation bias. They would look at you and say, well, because you're a black man or because you're, you know, homosexual or because we don't like your looks or because we found a couple pieces of evidence we're a lot of, under a lot of stress to solve this crime, you know, in my mind, I've already decided you're guilty. And I'm going, and when you do that, you know, this is true in life in general, in my mind, I've already decided that uh, Putin's invasion of Russia is evil and there's to be no possible reason to, to, to make that that there's another side to that story at all, right? Confirmation bias. And anything I hear gets screened out based on that. And the same with someone in the interrogation room. The one case that I looked at in any detail was the case of, you know, it wasn't specifically a read technique, but it was very similar, probably informed by that kind of uh, training um, on some level of a, of a Navy cooked analyst back in the late 1990s by the name of Daniel King. He was a, uh, he worked for the NSA, Will. He, he was, he, he was a Navy, he was a Navy petty officer, I believe, but he was assigned to the NSA to do cryptanalysis. And um, they accused him of giving information, I forget it was to the Russians or the Chinese or somebody. And uh, they did the same, they, they didn't take, they took him to a hotel room somewhere and just kept him under interrogation all day long and, and used that kind of good cop, bad cop. And... Uh, until finally there, he was saying to himself, I, I don't remember myself. If you're saying I did this, then maybe I must have done it. You know, I, I, let me speak to a psychologist. Maybe you can hypnotize me. Mm. And that will get to the truth. You know, of course. And, and then finally he confessed. Going back to yeah, that, uh, going back to the, uh, the example you gave about the good cop, bad cop, right? Is yeah. there also a link to that? Also to the whole, you know, prisoner's dilemma, the same, the same technique. Uh, uh, about the prisoner's dilemma, you know, um, you separate the two prisoners or two, right. and then, you know, you pretty much play them against each other one night. Yeah, I've it's come across similar. that before, but I, I don't know that they use that particularly. I think that was often used as a logic thing. I mean, maybe, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar enough to know if that has fit in or was used as part of their, how that fits into this paradigm that they've used. I, in, in, you know, I re recently, you know, read in part in preparation, went back and reviewed. I had a copy, luckily, of John Reed's criminal interrogation book. It's all blurred out, but it's, it's what it is. <laughs> Probably the second edition, and there was nothing in it like that. So they almost don't rely on any um, academic or uh, uh, very little, at least, at least in their heyday. Maybe today they do more, but uh, I'm not familiar with enough to, to, to comment on more on that. Right. Yeah, it's possible, possible, you know, what they, what they looked at a lot, of course, and when I was doing the research on the biological warfare, Korean war, and uh, there was a, um, a organization called the research and development board of the Pentagon. And its job was to assess technologies that the United States government and military might want to use. And oftentimes those were things like, you know, obviously bombers and the kinds of planes and submarines, but also interrogation techniques. And they joined up with the CIA in the early 50s on something called Project Artichoke. Project Artichoke was a precursor to um, MK Ultra program and the successor as well to an earlier CIA program, program called Operation Bluebird. And this was about interrogation and trying to control people and to induce, if they could, amnesias. And um, they were, this was all in, in kind of elaborate spy thing in which, you know, we're talking about dealing with double agents and sending people into the field and you know, protecting them from giving up secrets and 
ferreting out secrets from other double agents. And anyway, crazy stuff. And then, you know, this was the stuff when the CIA famously became involved in experimenting with LSD and, and stuff like that in interrogation and other drugs. But the artichoke people, they had, um, for a while, they had developed a, 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 uh, a, um, a paradigm of, of CIA style interrogation, which was essentially to give people, um, what do they call them? Speedballs. You give them benzedrine and you give them barbiturates, which were heavy downers. And then you um, subject them, give them also hallucinogens, or you hypnotize them, or you give them electric shock. There were different variations. And the idea was to regress the person and to make them talk, of course, and, um, and to be able to maybe implant ideas in their minds to control them um, and to turn them, perhaps, or to make them even, as the famous movie, the Manchur and book, The Manchurian Candidate, said, perhaps even to program to be assassins, assassins who would forget what they did once they assassinated the person. And that's uh, allegedly, some people believe that's what Sirhan Sirhan did to Robert Kennedy. <laughs> so um, in, in, in one of their reports that I ferreted out from the early 50s, they're talking about the kinds of research, this, this joint board of the, of the Department of Defense and the CIA, kind of research that they're looking at to justify um, the work they're doing on the artichoke um, project. And one of the um, things I have made sure that I wrote it down because I don't want to get it wrong is uh, I was kind of surprised. I mean, there were other groups. There was a University of Rochester was doing, um, working on drugs that might affect psychological pressures and Indiana University was involved. And, and then I looked and I saw John E. Reed and Associates. This is in 19, January 1953. And um, uh, under Navy contract, project number 173-181 for $34,000. That's in for fiscal year 1952, $1952, $34,000, according to what I looked up, is equivalent in today's money to about $385,000. That's this. A fair amount of money to give for an interrogation project to a uh, little John E. Reed, who's uh, John E. Reed and Associates, a uh, company in Chicago. And what was the project supposed to be on, on interrogation devices and procedures? Um, the project was to, quote, develop novel and easily used methods of causing lying subjects to think they have betrayed themselves. So First of all, how do you know someone's lying, right? Isn't the whole point of the interrogation to determine whether or not what a person is telling you is true or not? But if you already presume that they're lying, this is the whole methodological problem with the read technique in general, is they have these methods and they claim, mostly they claim that uh, they use nonverbal evidence to tell that you're, you know, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm swallowing too often or I'm I might, we can't see her. I'm tapping my head and I'm a little nervous, seem nervous. Oh, you seem nervous. Uh, you must be guilty. My mouth is dry. All of these nonverbal or physiological things. But the research over and over shows scientific research, which means looking at things under control and comparing groups, et cetera, that, that there is no reliable correlation between all of these different nonverbal and, uh, and physiological responses, purely physiological responses to the, to prove that someone is lying, right? Just because I'm, I'm when you say, uh, did you kill somebody? And I look up like this, uh, uh, no. Ah, he looked up and to the left. That means he's lying. My cop's instinct tells me he's lying. I mean, they've done research to show, you know, where they, uh, you know, they've looked at what a police officer thinks and feels about somebody's guilt or innocence and then uh, what it later turned out to be. And, and it's no better than flipping a coin. In other words, you know, cops are no better, even with all the experience they've had with bad people. And they do deal with bad people. Did that make them better able to tell whether somebody is being deceptive or not? So um, anyway, so here's John Reed back in 1953 you know, uh, uh, doing research for the, the Navy. And the Navy was often used, by the way, as a cutout for projects for the CIA. 
And so the question arises whether this just wasn't for the CIA anyway. And certainly 10 years later, 1963 or so, when uh, uh, the CIA internally put out a manual for interrogation, which today is, seems is known as the QBARC manual. QBARC was the CIA's own name for itself. It's counterintelligence uh, interviewing and interrogation, um, in which they um, spent about a third of that manual describing coercive techniques of interrogation, use of drugs, sleep deprivation, you know, uh, threats of harm, uh, sensory deprivation, other kinds of things, solitary confinement, um, as ways to, uh, to coerce people to confess. That's so, what they call you now, enhanced um, interrogation technique. Huh? Yes. And then, and in fact, I, when I saw that, I said to myself, this has to be related to the earlier work that was done, the QBARC and MK Ultra. And sure enough, that was finally validated in a document that was released via an ACLU lawsuit. And there was a, a memoir, an internal memoir by um, the head of the CIA's medical services division. And they were involved in the enhanced interrogation program. And his memoir is his memory to some kind of internal board about what, uh, what went on, what went down after 9-11. And uh, yeah, he made it quite clear that there was a group of people who were quite enamored with MK Ultra, and there was even one figure who was uh, kind of connected all the way back to the 1980s into using those kind of techniques and had been reprimanded for it supposedly many years before, and who was put in charge of the interrogations after 9/11. So there are a lot of direct links, and we don't even know all the you know we we can't know all the uh, the ins and outs of. But I, I one thing I. I always bring this up, and I, I seem to be the only one who, who thinks this is odd. But um, the two major cases of uh, um, that were used as paradigms, one by the CIA and one by the Department of Defense. The CIA, uh, their victim or their guinea pig was a man by the name of Abu Zubeda, who's still in Guantanamo today. And the other was a man recently released, only just, I think, earlier this year from Guantanamo, Mohammed al Qatani who people might remember Time Magazine publishing the interrogation logs um, of al Qatani's interrogation, where he was, you know, spun around in a chair and, you know, uh, forced nudity and dogs, you know, threatening him and all sorts of stuff. Um, he was their first, you know, he was their model prisoner. Uh, they were first testing out their theories of coercive interrogation after 9-11. Both of these men, had had experienced serious head trauma in their, as he, when they were younger. And uh, Katani, in fact, apparently had been, was, had become schizophrenic and, and they knew this all along and covered it up. Um, Abu Zubeda um, had, had uh, ter epilepsy, um, had seizures as a result of his terrible head injury. So is it just coincidence or what are the chances the two primary figures used to, to begin and to, and to test out their new theories of torture, both were people who had had se severe head trauma, a history of severe head trauma. History of severe head trauma is not a typical thing. You know, if you think about it in your lives and yourselves and your listeners, how many people do you know, really, who've had se serious head trauma? Not, you know, maybe well, one or two, but you probably know, you know, dozens if not hundreds of people. Going back to what you were saying about the... Uh... When kind of a, I, remember, I recall two, while, while, you, while I was hearing you, I recall two incidents in that time. Um, one was uh, Jose Padilla. I don't know if you remember him. He was a yeah. former, uh, former gang member from yes. um, Chicago, I believe, a uh, convert to uh, Islam. And yeah. apparently he got picked up by the FBI. You know, he was, uh, he was about to go to, I uh, believe he was about to go to Iraq or Afghanistan to join the, uh, the Mujahideens and, and fight or whatnot. Anyway. Um, so he got picked up and, and he's kind of disappeared and you, you, you didn't hear him, you didn't hear him, the president talking about him again, you know, at the time when he got picked up was a real sensation, but you didn't hear him again until like months later, probably a year later, uh, he was a trial, he was a trial and then he was kind of, uh, during the trial, I, re I recall seeing, uh, like images, he was kind of like in, uh, in the infantile stage, you know, he was in, he was kind of disoriented. Mm -hmm. He was all there, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's one. And that's one of the things I was, you know, that came to my mind as I was hearing you about, you know, 
about yeah. this Pepsi and all that. And that's another case that also from that era was about this woman. Uh, she was an uh, American, um, American Muslim woman, I believe, uh, Arab woman, Arab descent. Mm-hmm. She, um, um, apparently she was going to join via the fight. And also she got picked up, got arrested. Um, and then she disappeared from the media. You hear from her mm-hmm. again. And all of a sudden she just appeared somewhere like in Qatar, somewhere in a, in a CIA interrogation. Um, yeah. and then she shot the, she shot the agent and she got killed. Um, yeah. Uh, do you remember, do you, do you recall those cases? Yeah, that, her name was Afia Siddiqui, Siddiqui, and she was a, uh, related to Muhammad, uh, uh, um, uh, what's his name, supposedly the mastermind of 9-11, uh, was in Guantanamo today, uh, um, K- uh, K- KSN, uh, Khalid Sheikh Muhammad. Sheikh Muhammad. Yeah, so she's related to him, and her children were taken from her, yes, I don't know, that, that, that whole story is is very mysterious and uh, obscure, and I don't have enough information about it. I know more about Jose Padilla because I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. He was, of course, imprisoned in the naval uh, brig in Charleston, South Carolina, along with another American Muslim by the name of Ali Almari. Almari, who uh, has claims today that he was tortured by the FBI uh, at the time, but uh, um, that's another story. But the uh, but um, Padilla, uh, you know, claimed that, that that you know, yeah, he he was really messed up. He first claimed that they would gave him LSD or some other kind of hallucinogen. Um, the um, the Department of Defense owned up to they, they claimed that they did not use hallucinogens on him. But the one thing that they did admit to, which was odd, they claimed that they told him that they gave him hallucinogens when really they were giving him a flu shot. Well, first of all, that's that itself is is, is is torture and admission of criminal activity. You know, you know, imagine you went to uh, the doctor, and the doctor told you um, uh, you get a flu shot, and they gave you the flu shot. I don't know if you guys get flu shots. I do. I'm an older person. I don't know. They give you the flu shot, and the doctor says, "I guess what? I didn't give you a flu shot. I just injected you with LSD." I'm serious. That's what I did. And he held to that story. I mean, that guy would be, if it ever came out, of course, that guy would lose his license and maybe even prosecuted for criminal, you know, behavior. So um, anyway, they did that. They admitted doing that to Jose Padilla. And who, who knows what else they did to regress this guy. And that's the, behind all of this, there was a, uh, a theory to the interrogation that's used by the U.S. government, um, the coercive interrogation, the psychologically coercive. And, they, and that. Um, it was uh, um, developed by you know, some famous psychologists, um, and it was published in a, a, a journal, actually, called Sociometry in the mid-50s. And the paradigm they came up with was called DDD, three Ds, because I kind of made like a formula. And it was uh, dependency, uh, um, debility, and dread. What are these things? Dependency, of course, is... T- to, to re, they want to regress you to which you're totally dependent on your captor, right? No matter what you say or do, can't even, you know, go to the bathroom unless they tell you, right? And, you know, you can't do anything. You're totally dependent on them for your life and for everything. Dread, of course, is fear. I dread, you know, to instill a sense of dread in somebody. Constant dread breaks a person down. And then finally, debility is just a fancy word for weakness. To instill weakness by making them weak, by keeping them from sleeping, sleep deprivation, uh, using stress positions, and also uh, um, kind of partially starving people. Uh, you know, kind of, that's what they do. You know, give you a, a and, and they do this at Guantanamo. They did this, and they've admitted to doing it. A caloric, a restriction of caloric intake. Not enough, they say harm you but why are they doing that at all there is are they doing it to save money no they're doing it because they're trying to break you down to re- and to regress you and what happens is all those things affect physiological brain function um and this was recognized by the cia's own researchers back when they were doing mk ultra they looked at all this stuff and they said well if you do these kind of things to people they won't be able to function too well and there's an, an Irish researcher, uh, Shane, Shane O'Meara, I think, who's written about this saying, 
Yeah, these aren't serious interrogation techniques because what they do is they reduce your ability to remember. They inhibit your ability to re recall. You know, if you're starving and you're tired, and you're, you're, you're living in fear of, of something, um, it's going to be really hard to remember things. So what are they really doing? Um, as a, as a, you know, so there's a, a, a weird line between interrogation and uh, manipulating people to control them or in the military parlance to exploit them for propaganda purposes, for show trials, you know, uh, or for uh, perhaps to turn them into be, this happens a lot more than this we talked about, and to turn them for intelligence purposes and make them into double agents or just their own agents if they weren't double agents, right? Um, and you've heard this over and over where the uh, FBI, for instance, will, you know, catch some kind of young person, you know, they're like 17, 18 years old in a chat room and then kind of lead them on to say crazy stuff and then, you know, tell them, oh, you'll meet with us, you meet with them. And anyway, they, they, they kind of set them up and then they say, well, you know what, uh, we can put you away for a long time for terrorism or you can work for us. Why don't you go to this mosque and just report on us what people are saying, what they're doing and tell us about this person. Now, Guantanamo, one reason that they hate or they hated uh, Julian Assange so much for so many re different reasons, but in, in terms of Guantanamo, um, WikiLeaks released a, a, a slew of all of the, um, of what they had anyway, of, uh, um, of the detainee files of what, you know, what they supposedly did, who said what to who, and they're footnoted and everything, and what you, what the, people did like Andy Worthington researcher who looked at this and others is you could see that they were setting up a crazy quilt system, which and this can happen. This kind of bleeds back into the read technique too, in which somebody says something, it's a false confession. And now you've implicated somebody else. And then they take that up and go, that's fact. So let's say that, you know, we tortured, um, detainee X and detainee X said, you know, gee, Henri told me, that, you know, he wanted to place a bomb on a train. And so now we go to, we go to Henri and we have him in the interrogation booth and we say, Henri, we know that you um, wanted to put a bomb on that train. We have people who've told us that. No, no, that's a lot. Now, if you're the read technique, by the way, you don't allow denials. You, you, you put a stop to that as quickly as possible because you're going to convince them to confess. So you have... And what you had at Guantanamo were hundreds of people and, and many, you know, many of them had been flipped to, to uh, um, I don't know how many, uh, well, we, we can't know, but some of them anyway had been flipped to inform on others. And some of them just gave false testimony to, because they were scared or to get better, you know, to get better treatment and all sorts of reasons. And so it's also possible a few of those reasons were that someone actually knew something. That, you know, that was true about somebody else. And they said it under interrogation, but we, but, uh, okay, but what seemed overwhelming was how many people were framed up out of a cloud of a mass of different false confessions or false admissions or implications about other people's behavior when under coercion. So coercion, by, if I was a central theme of what I'm saying, it's really the use of, co of coercion, psychological coercion sometimes physical coercion, and the line can be blurry there, and often is, to make people do what you want, to control them, and to, uh, for your own purposes. And the United States isn't alone in this, by, by the way, of course, but I live in the United States, and it's the mature, you know, I read English, I don't read a lot of other languages, or any really, except some Spanish, some French, but, uh, uh, you know, my access is to the American issue story here. And, 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 uh, and of course, America has the distinction of being the first country to set up a worldwide torture network. They set up secret torture centers, you know, in prisons in, in many countries, around, you know, um, around the world, in Thailand, Poland, in Lithuania, you know, in Afghanistan, um, and, uh, and elsewhere. And, uh, and they got other countries from around the world uh, to participate and help them out in a, in a mass program of kidnapping people to these torture centers 
secret torture centers where they would torture. They use various sorts of, uh, you know, even if they weren't waterboard, you know, and the waterboard, they said, well, we only waterboarded three people. Yeah, well, waterboarding isn't the only kind of torture. And in fact, people who had been waterboarding, like Abu Zubaydah, said that was not the worst sort of torture that they endured. Right? That far worse, you know, was uh, the use of uh, isolation, sleep deprivation, isolation, and uh, um, sensory deprivation. And I mentioned those three because guess what? The United States still uses it today. The um, Army Field Manual on Interrogation um, FM 2-22, I think, um, uh, which is a, a human intelligence interviewing and interrogation, um, which was uh, rewritten. Uh, we're now, this is, was rewritten in 2006 and it has been used ever since. It has a special provision. And not only does it use call for techniques such as mutt and jaw, good cop, bad cop, or uh, uh, something called fear up, where we try and you know make you afraid, in order to you know pull up, make people feel dread, um, futility, make people feel hopeless. Um, but also, there's a special provision that uh, for people who supposedly don't fit Geneva protections, and who are those? Of course, the people they held at Guantanamo, or the so-called terrorists or people who they claim are non-privileged combatants. By privilege meaning they don't carry the privilege of being under the Geneva protections. They're not prisoners of war. They're prisoners of war. And those people you can do other things to. What can you do? You can put them in solitary confinement 30 days at a time and keep renewing it potentially forever. Or you can put them under uh, sensory deprivation, put blackout goggles and mittens on you and big, you know, if you saw those uh, pictures from the very early days of Guantanamo where they were in the orange suits and they had the big earmuffs on and the goggles and they couldn't, see. that's, that's called field expedient separation. In other words, it's a form of sensory deprivation, which in fact can induce psychosis in people who don't have it. Some of the earliest research, and I, I did a talk on this, uh, the American Psychological Association back in 2007. And uh, went back and looked at the history of the research of this, and uh, it's it's quite astounding. You know, the 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 human, you know, the CIA scientists looked at the human organism, and they tried to de kind of deconstruct it and figure out what can really mess it up. And one of the things they found was that every human being has a need for stimulation. Every organism does, whether you're a little one cell protoplasm or you're a human being. You're, we evolved for a certain environment, for a certain set of circumstances, right? So we need to eat. That's genetic, right? I mean, that's built into us. It's not like no one can just stop breathing or eating, right? And we also, we need to feel connected to other people. We're a social animal. We're not, you know, somebody who just, you know, hatches out of an egg and then goes off and uh, uh, lives, you know, in solitary. And then one time in his life goes out and uh, mates with somebody you find out in the, uh, in the wild and then die. Uh, no, we, we, we're social animals. We live in social communities. You know, if, uh, um, if you're, um, I mean, all you have to do is look at all the literature there is lately about people being uh, bullied online and how terrible it feels to have people ganging up on you in an internet chat room. And why does it feel terrible? Well, because human nature tells us we want to belong and we don't like being, you know, ca cast into some kind of bad, you know, person and, and uh, um, ostracized, right? To be ostracized is a bad thing. It's not a good thing. So anyway, um, the, uh, the Army Field Manual, you know, allows for this kind of isolation separation and sleep deprivation, you know, you know, there's the debility, right? I mentioned the DDD. Um, the CIA's form of enhanced interrogation said, we can keep somebody from sleeping for like six, seven days, right? We can do that. At first, that's, you know, you know that's, you know, we're gonna, you can chain them up there. The form of sleep deprivation was to chain people up, like and hang them, suspend them. And then if they started to fall asleep, go wake them up. And then, and, and, you know, there were, it was pretty horrible. And uh, so the, the Army Field Manual is a little bit more 
sophisticated. So they're not chaining people up and keeping them up for six, seven days. What they said was, we can keep someone from ha- only from having um, no more than four hours sleep a day for 30 days, and that's renewable. You know, so anyone here who's gone on four hours sleep knows that, and eh, the next day you're gonna not feel so great. And if you do that again and again and again and again and again and again, and I could just go on 30 times and bore your listeners. But if I could do that, you're going to be a mess. You start breaking down. Um, So that's allowable under the current Army Field Manual. An Army Field Manual, which, by the way, the liberals in Congress, the Democratic Party, championed as an alternative to the CIA's enhanced interrogation techniques and wrote it into law, mandated this manual, putting it in and saying, this is, this is what we use. So we can keep people, you know, also we will include reduced caloric intake, manipulation of the environment, meaning we can make it, you know, pretty cold in your cell. We'll make sure you don't get hypothermia, but you're going to be uncomfortable. All of these are ways to destabilize and break down a person. DDD, make them afraid, fear up. They have a technique also called um, ego down, which is to insult you, make you feel terrible. Um, they even changed the the wording of the fear up in the 2006 manual from what it used to be, because it had been in earlier versions of the manual. But in this manual, they now said, guess what? We can uh, use, uh, uh, we can form new fears. Before the idea was that we leverage o- uh, fears that we already learned you had. So if we like Abu Zubaydah, you're afraid of insects. Well, we're going to make you afraid that maybe we're going to put you in a box with insects. But uh, the new Army Field Manual, the one that came in in 2006, now said you can create whole new phobias and fears people never even had before. So that, that allows for a lot more creativity by the interrogator. And of course, they were encouraged to mix all of these together in all sorts of different ways. So it's pretty horrific. I mean, uh, and today this has fallen off of the you know, the human rights groups used to talk about this and they used to make a big deal out of it. And once Obama became president, to be honest, they kind of dropped it because uh, either they hoped he would do something, he said he would, he, he had an executive order, he started a new group called the High Value Interrogation Group that was going to research humane interrogation and do all this. But the Army Field Manual is still there and there's some good people in government who continue to keep trying to change that and bring this out. But it never really gets any traction. And here I wrote about it first uh, about 12 years ago. And here we are 12 years later and nothing's changed. Nothing. There's a film. There's a film called uh, My Name is Khan. I don't know if you heard, if you heard about it. Um, mm-hmm. came out in 2010. And, and, and it, it's about a, uh, it's like a romance, drama romance, right? Um, um, there's, um, they're like Pakistani, I believe. And the, uh, the protagonist, he's kind of a little, uh, uh, kind of challenged. Um, and, uh, and he falls for, 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 um, this other woman. Anyway, long story short is that, uh, uh he get picked up as a, a terrorist a suspect, all right? And he get, you know, taken to, to the police or get taken to, to, uh, whoever picks him up, the FBI and whatnot, and they do. And in the, in the part of the film shows the exact, so everything you just said right there about sleep deprivation and mm-hmm. making the room mm-hmm. cold and, you know, uh, keeping them up, mm-hmm. uh, showed in that film and, and, and the, it, mm-hmm. all the techniques and everything. He just keep calling, he just keeps saying, I am calm. My name is calm. My name is calm because, uh, apparently they, they, uh, the whole thing is that they were looking for another person with, with the same name and they just picked them up. And they just mm-hmm. they did all that all the technique on him, all the torture technique on him. Um, and that's one of the points I want to bring. Cause this, um, I saw this film on, I think, uh, Netflix, I'm not sure, but, uh, uh you mentioned Netflix earlier about this other incidents and other, mm-hmm. uh, cases that happened and then it's like that. I just want to ask you, what is the relation between, you know, all this covert uh, spy stuff and everything, but then it shows in film. You I know, mean, what's the purpose of showing in film? It's supposed to be covert, you know. Is it some? Is it a way to desensitize the public? Or, you know, what, what's mm-hmm. your 
Right. I mean, are you saying, well, how, how do these things even come out? Yeah, they always come out in movies. They always make a movie about it. Yes. You know, like, oh, you know, uh, there was, you know, something happened and they make a movie about it. What's the other one? The, uh, the Zero Dark Hundred and, you know, how. Zero Dark Thirty. Yes. And then 24, you know, they just make movies about it, you know. Um, Well, I'd say a lot of it comes under the, the dread part of DDD. In other words, they, they're quite specific. They've said they. They don't want people to know or be sure exactly what the government's going to do to you when they get you. Now, we're talking about national security, by the way, interrogations. And I have to say, John Reed and all of this was, so far as we know, is mostly about criminal interrogations. And while there's a lot of similarities uh, and even a lot of byplay between them. So, for instance, uh, Richard Zuli, who was a Chicago policeman, um, and uh, later was put in charge or was one of the leading figures in the interrogation of uh, Ma- Muhammadu Oslahi, where they made the movie out of his famous today uh, uh, Guantanamo figure and was in charge of uh, you know, some pretty intense national security interrogation. So there's bleed over between the criminal cop world and the uh, ter- you know national security interrogation world. But to get to your point, though, I, I think some of this stuff does get leaked. I think even waterboarding to some extent was that. I mean, I think there were people who wanted to use and test out this waterboarding stuff, but um, it got out there and and there were leaks. Now, it's hard for me to say. There were definitely people inside the government who were really uh, upset over what the U.S. government was doing, and they leaked this material out. And the uh, International Red Cross who was interviewing some of these detainees they were upset too. Now they're not supposed to talk about it, but I think after a while they got upset and some leaks may have come out of there. So some of this material came to us from leaks by people who um, were trying to be whistleblowers really that the U.S. was using torture. But I don't discount the idea that you might be hinting at that some of this material is allowed out there because yeah, they, they would like the bad guys or who they think are the bad guys to think that um, if we get you, who knows what we'll do to you? We're barbaric, right? Um, you don't know whether or not, um, you know, how you're, you know, what you're going to be treated. They might, you know, you're going to be sitting in that cell wondering if they're going to come in and throw you up against a wall and then waterboard, right? That's going to make you very nervous. And in reality, just fear alone is enough to make, break a person down and make them talk. So, yeah, I don't know uh, how much of this uh, uh, is, you know, leaked so that they could, uh, you know, make people fear the government and, uh, um, and when they get captured, want to talk because they fear something worse or, or we're hearing about it in the media because, you know, of whistleblowers. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. A lot of these films. A lot of these films, they they have consultants. They have uh, DOD consultants. They have wow. uh, military consultants. You know, like like twenty four and zero. You know, Doc thirty. Okay, and and one of the things, one of the things I think it does also, it, it, it trivializes it trivializes the, the incident. You know, for the American yeah. public. You know, um, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, you know, it just trivializes it, and then the American public just desensitizes. Yes, you know, just definitely. Not, not and it dehumanizes the people who were victimized by this. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And re- it reinforces that the humanization as well. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. And it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, you know, uh, and most Americans just aren't aware. Uh, well, they thought about it. They go, yeah, I guess so. But just, you know, how, how damaging the torture and these kind of things are to people. Uh, um, right now, I know in the press just right now, uh, um, the detainee at Guantanamo, I'll, I'll um, uh, Abalucci, I believe his name is, a Libyan prisoner, was tortured by the CIA. Now he's at Guantanamo and uh, um, has been asking for years to get medical treatment for the, re- you know, re- uh, torture, what they call torture rehabilitation. Remember, I worked at a place, it was a torture rehabilitation center. What does that mean? You hook people up with doctors and psychologists or therapists who can help them work through the trauma of torture. Most torture victims, uh, most. They probably most, but I would say many, if not most, end up with severe PTSD and depression. And, and many of them, of course, have also physical, you know, can have physical problems as well. And, uh, uh, there, you know, the U.S. has been withholding 
that kind of you know necessary treatment to former torture victims at Guantanamo, and um, uh, so that that's just in the news today. I, I, today, past couple of days, there's articles on that in the New York Times. Uh, Carol Rosenberg wrote some articles about this, so uh, New York Times reported. So um, yeah, this kind of stuff is it happens, and uh, most uh, most Americans don't know. They're not going to. It'll come on twenty four, and then have a whole episode about how. The guy who, uh, what was the guy, this character's name on 24? Jack Keith Bauer. Jack Bauer. You know, they don't do another whole episode on how the guy Jack Bauer held a gun to his head and put it in his mouth and tried to blow his head off. How, you know, he's, you know, turned into a total mess and can't function in the world afterwards. And, and now it just moves on. Like, that's nothing, right? Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, really a shame. Really a bad, evil aspect about our culture. If this is minimalized the way they talk or sensa- you know, sensationalized and then minimized. Yeah. So, um, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, get back to a few more specifics about the, um, about the read technique. Yeah. Um, I wanted to add to what you mentioned earlier, doc, about, uh, about Daryl Parker, because Daryl Parker's story goes hand in hand with the crew with not with specifically with the creation of the technique, but with the legend around its use so daryl parker's a dude what was a dude from lincoln nebraska he was accused of murdering his wife the nebraska cops tried to get him to confess and then they ended up calling in john reed who was a a, a relatively new addition to the chicago police and a, a, a new attorney but he had been uh known by word of mouth that he was able to get people to confess so he went there he was able to get Daryl Parker to confess, but Daryl uh, recanted his story immediately the next day. Um, he ended up being convicted of the murder despite recanting. And that particular, the, the info around that was used to cement John Reed as somebody who was capable of doing these kind of interrogations of bringing people in who hadn't been able, uh, who other investigators or cops were not able to get them to uh, confess. So many years later, a, um, a guy that was already serving time in prison for other violent crimes after he died, his attorneys notified, um, the authorities there in, in Lincoln that he had actually confessed to the crime that Daryl Parker was convicted of. And, um, he went, he's, you know, gone through a years long journey to, to get justice for himself, but eventually his conviction was thrown out and they were able to um to to help with his situation but despite the fact that he recanted his statement john reed and john e reed and associates the firm that he founded used these kind of these kinds of legends these kind of stories about being able to get people to confess to give more backing to the reed technique now the the reed technique came um after years of of changes within law enforcement that um, started with uh, something called the, the Wickersham Commission in, uh, in 1931. And they specifically dealt with this term called the third degree, which what Dr. K mentioned earlier about, you know, shoving bright lights in people's faces, keeping them isolated, um, lots of, you know, diff- different ways of, of psychologically messing with someone up to and including physical violence. Um, the report said that they, the people, the experts that they talked to back in the thirties, the police investigators and captains and stuff, they all kind of poo pooed the whole, the third degree is gone. We've done away with it. We don't even use it anymore, but obviously it, it, it hadn't gone away. And so two things developed in the, in the path of that. The first was uh, polygraph examinations, which is something we'll touch on uh, briefly today, but we need, we'll probably talk about that more in a, uh, in a future episode but a, a way to try to figure out and uh, through polygraph, through scientific determination, who is actually lying, actually hooking somebody up to a machine, measures the respiration, measures their, how much they're sweating. And it, it, it has no scientific backing whatsoever. It does not tell you whether or not a person is being truthful or not. Essentially, you might want to look at it as, as, a, as a prop. It's a prop that investigators and interrogators use to say that the machine told me, sir, that you have lied to me. And by having that backing that they could get more information out of uh, who they were speaking to. 
What happened with John Reed is that in, in that same time, John Reed developed what were, what is now referred to as the Reed technique. And it has, it has, and still does to a certain extent, the, the, the trappings of science to say that it is still scientific, that there are measurable things that a person does that can be seen like what you mentioned earlier, doc, that if I shift in my seat, if I look a certain direction, if I'm sweating a lot, if I do certain things that that means definitively that someone is lying again, no scientific backing. There is no way that, that you can possibly know that. So, um, to get onto the, to the read technique specifically and, and break it down a little bit, this was a course that I went through as a drug investigator in the army. Um, it is the most widely taught interrogation technique in the world. Police officers, investigators, federal agents, the world over use a, this technique or an approximation of it to get lots of different kinds of confessions. Um, and that's not to say that every confession the read technique gets could have been coerced or false, but it does have very specific parts of it that can really bring that forward. Um, so the, the, and this is a part of this was some of the stuff that I was trained in, you know, kind of the basics when I became a drug investigator. I had been a, a combat MP, for lack of a better way to put it, up until that point. I taught Iraqi police in Iraq and, and did other things like that, but I didn't deal really in day-to-day um, -day law enforcement as far as the military was concerned up until that point. So this was taking this course along with the training I got then kind of began all that together. So the first step is that you're, you want to establish a rapport. And when doing that, we used to use our our CID form that we would fill out for a name, person's name, address, their unit, their, their birthday, their, you know, maybe some parents info, but essentially something, you know, you make it nice and casual. You're trying to make them comfortable. You want them to, you want them to eventually when questions begin, you know, to be open to answering. So you're, you're trying to make it as uh, non-accusatorial as you can at that point. Um, and then, then the next step, and this is really important for all law enforcement, but in the, in the army, we use a form called uh, department of the army form 3881, which is giving someone their Miranda rights. And it is a very simple by the book. You go down each step and you let people know that they, they don't have to answer any of your questions that they can ask for an attorney at any time during the, at that particular moment. And we have them, they initial by each specific right that they get. And they sign at the bottom, swearing that, that this is what they want to do. And it, it, at the bottom, you can people can sign it by wa waiving their rights, and then or they can not sign it and say, "I'm sorry, I, I don't wish to be questioned, or I want to have an attorney." Um, it's important to note about Miranda rights, just in general, that um, it's it's there's reason to believe that innocent suspects are much more readily willing to surrender their Miranda rights than other people because they make the, the simple uh, assumption that most of us would is I don't have anything to hide. So I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to answer your questions because I don't, I don't have anything to hide. Um, I have a quote here from a uh, professor, uh, Saul Kaysen, who's someone who has studied police interrogations. Yeah. In depth. He said, uh, quote, it appears that people have a naive faith in the power of their own innocence to set them free. Um, so assuming that they have now, they've, they've waived their rights, they've said yes to you as an investigator, and they're willing to sit down and have this discussion, then you begin what under the read technique is called the behavioral analysis interview. Right. And it's a series of pretty straightforward questions, and they're designed to give the interrogator a framework to work with in speaking to you. So they'll ask things about, you know, they'll say, you know, do, do you know anything about the offense in question? Do you know anything about this crime, murder? I dealt with drug offenses, so we didn't have uh, victims per se, aside from the state or the, the government. They were the only victims that we were representing, which can kind of make things kind of shady, but we could save that for a, for a different time. Um, and that at that time, going through that behavioral analysis interview, that that is the time when you as the investigator are looking for cues. You're looking for the cues of touching the face, of shifting in their seat, of sweating a lot. There's so many different ones that people give, give uh, backing to. Again, no scientific 
reliability whatsoever. But for someone as an investigator who's been told they have value, it can be a, a it can be something that is very powerful as far as what the investigator is uh, is looking for. Um, so I'll ask the person, can you please share about what you know about this crime? Um, you'll directly ask the person very bluntly if they committed the crime. And in doing so specifically about this question, you want to make it seem as blasé as possible. They say yes, they say no, you act like you don't care. You're, you're just writing things on a form at this particular point. Um, and so then you get into a different set of questions that are more about coercion. Um, and they usually relate to a person's family, um, how they were raised, how their family would feel, uh, and family being spouse, parents, friends, people in their world, how they would feel if they knew that this person being interrogated committed the offense in question. And essentially, you're giving the interrogator what your cue is about guilt. How do you feel about guilt? How does guilt play a role in your life? Um, ask them who would be most disappointed if they knew you did something wrong. If you committed a serious offense, who's the person in the world that you would most hate to disappoint? Um, and lastly, and certainly this isn't all inclusive. I did a lot of this from, from what I remember. They asked the person what should happen to the individual who committed the offense? You know, if this, especially, of course, if they said no. And the, the basic logic about that, and Doc, I'd, I'd love for you to chime in on this one, is that, um, you know, that, that generally speaking, a person who is innocent or feels that they're innocent is going to say, punish them. You know, whatever punishment is, is appropriate, whatever fits within line of what they did, okay. If they are guilty, then they're going to have um, addendums and they're going to say, well, maybe if this happened or maybe if that happened, we don't understand what the person went through. And that's, you know, the, the traditional wisdom is that, that that means that person is worried about guilt, or potentially their own guilt, but the guilt of, of someone, because the, given these are open-ended questions, they're not all about the person. It kind of, you know, it, it's supposed to just give you a general air of how they see those kind of things. Um, so then, then you're supposed to, I, I was trained that you leave the interrogation room, the interview room, mm -hmm. the inter interview room. I go back to my desk and I sit there for about 10 minutes or so. And I watch them on our little monitor thing and kind of seeing how they're responding to what just happened. And again, none of those questions were supposed to be really direct or accusatory. They're supposed to just be as blase, simple, filling out a form as, as possible for the most part. Then after that 10 or 15 minutes, and, and, and some of this is stuff that I was taught to, it's not all exactly specific to the read technique. Then you return to the interview room and you, uh, you give the, the person being interviewed something called a theme. And essentially what you do is you develop a theme based upon what you have learned about them how they take in guilt, how they, if they act. And, and of course, if they already admitted to it, like for my instance, did you use marijuana? Well, you know, and they say, yes, none of this has to happen. They say, yes, we fill out the details. We go through the thing. They get punished. Life goes on. That's as far as the read technique is concerned. But if they say, no, you come in with this theme and you're trying to convince them that it's okay. It's okay that they did the thing that they did. As long as you don't give them any kind of uh, reprieve of legal culpability, you can morally and ethically tell them, hey, dude, this is bullshit. I'm sorry. You know, you, this is this is this isn't right. I can't believe this is happening to you. I, I you know, but the thing is, is you're trying to slow walk them into admitting what actually happened. And it can get so dense at certain points. And the specific, I remember the specific example given in the course because it's floored me at that time. And it had to do with someone being questioned about child abuse, about actually putting their hands on a kid and, and sexually abusing them in some way. And the tech and the, the idea that they gave is that you, you, you essentially empathize with them as deeply as you can. And you tell them that it's, it's not such a big deal. It's not such a big deal. And in whatever way that you want to come around with that, 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 you know, maybe, maybe in your own weird way, 
you were trying to protect this child that instead you were actually abusing. But you give someone the ethical and moral space to let go of their angst a little bit, to, to get it out there. Um, and so at that point, assuming that they have confessed, you'll, uh, you'll make a statement. And generally speaking, and I'm, I'm for CID, we didn't record interviews, but, um, generally speaking these days, if any aspect of a police interrogation is recorded, it's usually only the creation of the statement. It's not the long, long hours, right. and then it could be short. It could be at hours of many, many hours of the beginning of the interview, all the different questions that were asked up into this point, it leaves out a whole bunch of context for anyone trying to look back and say, what actually happened in these hours when you were in this room being interrogated? So you'll create the statement. And generally speaking, when I was doing that, I wrote the statement for them. They would dictate to me what they wanted to say, and I would type it out. And then I would add in little questions if there were little clarifications I needed to make about what, what they had happened. Um, and as far as like for CID, that statement and the, and the, the rights waiver, the DA form 3881, those are the only evidence of the discussion. Those are the only things that are come out of that room. So whatever actually happened, if anything was actually threatened, if anything was not fitting within what the parameters of things, there's no record of it. You know, at, at best, there was a, another detective or an investigator watching on a, um, a monitor or something like that. Um, so that's just, and so I, I, I wanted to throw that out for everybody just to kind of have an understanding of what this is really about. Um, this is something that ordinary people can, can get approached with in their life that, you know, that police do investigations ending up police station, having to have this kind of discussion is not out of the realm of possibility. And like I mentioned about Miranda rights is that yeah. most people who see themselves as innocent and unaffiliated are much more willing to the rights. Yeah. Well, what I've always heard is you should never been told over and over again. I like, attorneys say this, you know, do, do not speak to the police. No, without an attorney present ever. You no. I don't care how innocent you are. You know, you could be the most, you know, you could have you just like, come down from heaven. <laughs> have a, 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 an attorney there with you. Yeah, at least um, because you don't know any, I, I truly believe that anybody just about could be susceptible to making a false confession if the circumstances were right. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Because of human psychology, human psychology that allows this to happen. Um, and it may not happen on a given day. It may be that on a different day, Daryl Parker, or let's say, wouldn't have confessed. Or <laughs> if it had been a different victim, he might not have confessed. Who knows, you know, what, you know, uh, uh, you know, kinds of, I know they, like, they try to leverage guilt, the idea of guilt. Yep. And then they truly believe in the urge to confess, which was a psychoanalytic um, concept, by the way, uh, uh, that was propagated a lot in the early 20th century is that, you know, criminals, and there's an urge to confess. So you, you see this uh, even in popular fiction in the tell, in works of Edgar Allan Poe, for instance, the telltale heart, the guy who, People do feel guilt and they do want to confess. Um, but thank you. For the, I haven't really uh, been able to hear somebody who's been through some of this training. It's very enlightening to hear what you were told and the steps and, and, and how you went through it. And uh, I know that they claim like, there's nine steps, you know, but they don't have to be followed religiously. But the whole idea is to produce a, as I see it, to produce a product. That product is the, the written confession. Mm -hmm. A written confession for court. You're going to book or by crook. You know, the, the Reed people claim that when there are false confessions, of course, they, this is still what they claim today. Anytime there was a false confession, it's because people just didn't follow the Reed technique properly. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were misusing it. They, you know, uh, they didn't understand it. They would stepped outside the boundaries to do something else, contaminate, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, and, uh, a lot of other people, of course, believe that, you no, know, it's, it's all cats and the researcher you mentioned and others, 
that you know, there's something inherently coercive about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and I, I, I'm in that camp myself and there is some, and I know that a lot of inter- uh, people today, um, that high value interrogation group that works under the, the auspices of the FBI, I believe mostly today, but it includes people from the CIA and the Department of Defense. They, you know, they're pushing something called the Mendez principles of non-coercive interrogation. Hmm. And look it up online, named after Juan Mendez, who had been the UN United Nations special rapporteur on torture for a while, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And he, he worked on this and it's inherently non, uh, uh, data driven, you know, uh, content driven versus are you not you know, informational interviewing, you know, you're not seeking a confession per se, or you're, you're just trying to solve a problem. Um, and of course with a lot of attention to the vulnerability of a suspect in police custody, you know, uh, anybody already who's in the custody of the police or the army or whatever, a military police or a foreign government, whatever, is already vulnerable, right? You're already in their power and they, they hold power of some sort. And that, you know, that has an effect uh, that can't be ignored. So um, I remember, you know, like I said, I interviewed torture victims. And one of the first things I did before I began such an interview, and then periodically during the interview, would be to check in with the client and it's certainly first at the beginning to explain to them how they were in really in control here. They wanted to get up at any time and say, stop, they could, right? If they wanted to go and smoke a cigarette, they could. They just make sure that, that they're able to have their, their agency for the entire right. thing. Right. And, but they had agency, exactly. If they didn't want to talk about something, they didn't have to. And I didn't impose my view on something. And, but, you know, it's, uh, we're, you know, we're very, uh, um, susceptible to other people's opinion of us even you know it can be if you got under the street and i've had this happen to me or maybe others and somebody a uh, crazy person on the street comes up to me and says you look like a you know an idiot and walks on you know well i shake it off but you know a little tiny piece of me goes i look like an idiot maybe i look there's something how i look there we go. i mean it's just you know we're very susceptible to this uh, and um you know, it's important. I, in today, I think the read, the read people have taken a hit over the years. I know some former read people left the read. Uh, I forget their names. Just a few years ago, um, another major training institute broke, so they're not going to use the read technique at all. They've decided it too leads to false confessions. It was a big deal. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Zuwacker, I think, was one of the guys, and they they trained under read. So it was like an apostasy or something right? oh, for the read people. You know, the read people, you know, they really try to, you know, they're, they're kind of litigious. And, uh, you know, they went after Netflix for some, uh, you know, something that happened a few years ago that was set on a Netflix documentary. And, you know, they try and preserve their legacy and, of course, their business um, because training is, is big business. So they train CIA, uh, foreign diplomats, you know, police departments, of course, the FBI. And there's a lot of money in that, and, uh, you know, and, and not everything they said about them is truly fair, but on the other hand, uh, there are some serious problems that they don't really own up to in my, in other people's opinion that, uh, um, have to do with the kind of inherent coercion to this process. And, uh, of, uh I know we started out talking, you know, it would be helpful to know what other work the read and associates people have done for the government, particularly for the FBI and the CIA over the years. I'm not talking about the training. I'm talking about any kind of research that may have been done because it might help us understand more about the history of all this, which is helpful, but also uh, it would speak to, you know, you know, some of, uh, you know, why they've stuck to certain positions that they have. You know, they hated, by the way, the Miranda on the second edition that I have the read in that book, a criminal interrogation and confession, uh, was put out right after Miranda decision in the sixties. And they are just the book almost is like a diatribe against the Miranda decision. Hmm. The Miranda decision, if you read, is really worth reading. It's, it reads uh, the Supreme Court's Miranda decision is fascinating reading in and of itself. It's it's uh, very well written. 
And uh, they do go after the read people at one point specifically, hence the read people's, you know, animus perhaps towards that decision. But, you know, they, they, they felt it was, it was really in a lot of you know, people today. And I'd say with what's going on with the Supreme Court, I haven't heard about any further attacks on Miranda. It has been shipped away over the years. You know, but uh, I know there are people who would like to see that go away, you know, to see it uh, uh, destroyed and so that you don't mourn people anymore. Doctor, wow. there's a, there's also an alternative uh, methods as well to really drain. Um, yes. I'm reading one uh, called the uh, Preparation and Planning, Engage and Explain Account Closure Evaluate. Uh, like the piece or that the uh that is used in the the uk um uh oh. is that a um in your opinion is that is that a um is that a, a fair alternative or a tool to 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 read i you know i'm aware of it i i you know I, it sounds like it is but i haven't investigated it you know the more i look at things sometimes you know people who run uh, these kind of things in the world, yeah. uh, particularly in the military intelligence side, they're always, you know, kind of protecting themselves and they're always looking for, you know, they, they don't give up their, you know, they want to control. And, and so I don't know, this may be a very humane technique. I, my, my, I'm sorry, I, I just really haven't investigated it enough, nor these new Mendez techniques that they're talking about. Wow. Um, um, I do know that when the high value interrogation group who uh, is against the Army Field Manual's techniques and putting forth these humane techniques, nevertheless, in their own research on false confessions, seem to me to have been engaged in some uh, questionable research behaviors when they went um, well, some years ago, uh, not that long ago, but into college campuses and, and did uh, research on uh, false confessions in which they took college students and divided them up and put them uh, uh, you know, to prove how easily false confessions can happen, but put people uh, in a situation where they had admitted that they were cheating when they weren't, you know, and, and told them that, you know, uh, would say things to them, well, how will your family feel when they find out that you were cheating in college and got expelled, right, to make them confess, college student, right? and they were, they were not read into this. And then later, of course, they were told afterwards, oh, this was all just a research thing. But, you know, you know, uh, that kind of that kind of can harm people, so it's very difficult to do research that replicates and um, uh, helps illuminate the the kind of dilemmas that occur around all of the things we're talking about uh, because of the da the potential dangerousness and the vulnerability we are so vulnerable, you know the vulnerable uh, ability to uh, so um, that's why it's hard to assess you know so if I were to look at the piece thing that you brought up is used in the UK or the Mendez, I'd have to do an awful lot of reading and thinking and talking. And uh, I, I just, my own research is taking me elsewhere. You know, the, the fact that I know something about the read technique comes out of my interest in interrogation in general, what I found out in the Daniel King case and what, you know, what, what I was told I needed to become somewhat aware of what was considered the mainstream interrogation so I could better understand the things that weren't mainstream or that were inherently abusive, like the appendix M of the Army Field Manual, which uses those techniques I talked about, or the enhanced interrogation techniques. But, you know, how are they really different? Well, okay, I better study and see. You know what? You know what is the control question technique? Or take, you know, read and you know, bow. And, uh, you know, what is the behavioral analysis interview? You know, that you were speaking to on. You know, and those kind of things. So I had a sense, you know, and, the, and of course, there's, a, you know, turned out, of course, there was overlapping aspects to these, to all of these things. But uh, definitely the read technique is not the enhanced interrogation technique. Uh, you know, that, that's of, a, of another whole, and it's with the third degree, you know, but it, it's its own thing and it uses, you know, it, 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 it it uses a form of psychological manipulation and, uh, you know, isolation of the, of the person in a, in a, in a controlled setting that makes some vulnerable people confess falsely to under, 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 under pressure and manipulation to, to something to, to end that 
dilemma that they're in. Like I mentioned, the prisoners, not the prisoners' dilemma, it's just the personal dilemma that they're in of being, you know, in this interrogation and being accused over and over again. Um, they say we don't accuse, don't accuse them, but what they say, do accuse them. I don't understand how they can say they don't accuse them. They are, they're saying, we have the information. Or we'll even say, you know, in the case of Daniel King, they knew, they gave him polygraph tests, and they knew that the results of the polygraph tests were, quote, um, inconclusive. But they went to him and they said, polygraph shows that you're lying. You know, and there's in the course have allowed the police to to decide uh, to dis, to lie, really, and to say uh, in the service of the that was mentioned that yeah. Was it Supreme Court was it a Supreme Court decision that they can lie or something like that? There was a I I don't have it in my hand, but there have been there have been of course different court decisions and some of them contradict each other, but uh yeah, I believe there was a decision that allowed a certain kind of deception yeah. was, was allowable. I can't think of them right now, but yeah. I can't think of the name and I can't think of the boundaries of deception that were allowed, but uh, it was quite disturbing to read that any deception was all. What, why? I'm trying to get to the truth, you know, um, you know, we're a lot more, we understand more today about what happens when our people are in a position of power. We've seen this with the, the Me Too movement and, you know, uh, ab you know abuse in the workplace or, or making a, a an unsafe workplace, you know, for people in various ways, you know, people in positions of power can misuse that power sometimes without even realizing they're doing it. And they need to be made aware of it because power differential is a real thing. But it, but nowhere is that I think really uh, uh, brought home as 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 important as in either a prison in, inside a jail or a prison itself or in an interrogation room, where there you are, you know. Um, uh, presuming you've been put under arrest, but even if you haven't put under arrest, you've just fallen under suspicion. Um, that itself is a very powerful, um, by the state apparatus, you know, a very powerful, um, situation, scary situation to be in. So again, if your listeners are listening, what do I do? You get an attorney, whatever you do, yep. get an attorney. Just remember yep. that. Don't say anything, get an attorney, and they will help you through it. I'll call Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll at least come bail you out. <laughs> well, I think that's a uh I think that's a good place for us to uh to wrap it up for today. Um, Dr. K, thank you for coming and, and joining us yeah, and thank you. your time and your your experience. Uh, I know you and I have gone back and forth about a a whole slew of other topics to uh to discuss to go along with these lines i'm sure at some point hopefully yeah. soon we'll do an episode specifically on the uh army's field manual on interrogation i yeah. do think yeah. that would be a, a good a good breakdown for our uh, for our audience but yeah well given that I, I never would have thought years ago that this would still be an issue in 2022 23 now we're going into and what it is People in the United Nations in 2014 told the United States government, you know, the United States government is a signatory. I know we're going over, but the United States government is a signatory, and it was ratified by Congress of a treaty called the Convention Against Torture. United Nations Treaty, most countries in the world are signatories to this, and say we don't torture, we don't do this. And one of the ways they, they put, and a mechanism was set up via the treaty to police that because torture is such a problem. And so that means that every so many years, each country comes up for a review and the United Nations reviews their policies and practices and what they, you know, report new reports of torture in that country. And they came to the United States back in 2014 for their review and they said, guess what? Your army field manual uses things that cause psychosis that could be construed as torture. You need to change that. All right, you need to rewrite that and change that. They were mandated to do that by law because something, I mean, this is serious. The Constitution says if you have a treaty and it's ratified by Congress, that has the force of law in the United States. That is U.S. law. And, the, you know, in the, and whether it's the Obama administration or the Trump administration or the Biden administration or much earlier, the Bush Cheney administration, they are breaking those laws repeatedly over and over and over again. That thing should have been rewritten and addressed, you know, 
way, you know, eight, eight, nine years ago, um, almost 10 years ago now. And, uh, wait a minute, maybe it was longer than 2004. I didn't have to go back. It was a long time ago. I think it might have been 2009. Um, so anyway, that's how, you know, so yeah, we should do that. I'm happy to talk about it. Sounds great, Doc. Well, well, thanks to uh, thanks to everyone for uh, for joining us today. I hope the discussion was uh, educational. I know I, I really enjoyed going back over it and lots of little questions and things. And um, hope to see you guys again next time. Take care. Money is tight these days for everyone. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks, Fahim Shirazi, James O'Barr, James Higgins, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Rick Coffey, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, and the Status Quo Podcast. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time.